Alrighty, so this presentation, we're going to be talking about how to educate investors on returns for apartment syndication. And so we're just going to go through a breakdown for the types of returns, resources to keep handy, uh, the, the types of resources to also keep handy, as well as you're talking through this and something that you can share with your investors. The most frequently asked, uh, frequently asked questions about returns, uh, an example that we use for our deals at PassiveInvesting.com, and then also just what our investment calculator looks like, just so you get, get a framework of um, you know, what you can include if someone was to try and project their returns for your deals. Before we go into that, though, a little bit about myself, and by very little bit, my name is Taylor Koo. I'm one of the Investor Relations Associates here at PassiveInvesting.com. I started in January 2022, and since then, I've raised about $16 million, a little over $16 million in capital. Now, the types of returns we're going to go through, we're going to go through the cash on cash return, average annualized return, the equity multiple, the internal rate of return. And then this one is a bonus, the preferred rate of return. Now, the preferred rate of return, it's not really a return, but since it's so commonly used, uh, I can at least go through just how we break that down and what sort of this, the, the preferred return implies. And the cash on cash return, I mean, this is a pretty simple one. Uh, you have your formula right there, your annual cash flow over your initial cash investment. And typically when it's in syndications, it's just referring to the cash flows that you are receiving throughout the holding period. Uh, so if there is no refinance in the first scenario, uh, and let's say you invest 100000 you're getting a return of 10000 per year, and this is return on capital, you can anticipate just a 10% average cash on cash return throughout the holding period. Now, here's a little bit of a caveat, and I've seen this with uh, several, with other operators as well, is when there is a refinance that is modeled into the deal. Now, and it, it's going to change in how people are, um, how people are, uh, I guess, projecting their cash on cash returns or how they're defining their cash on cash returns. Um, but a question that might come up, let's say when that refinance comes is what that cash on cash return would look like after that refinance and, and what that will be. And so if you take a look at scenario two right over here, in scenario two, you see that we have, uh, we're stabilizing the deal and then year two, we're refining and then uh, refining 50% back. So once you have 100,000 in your deal, you refi 50,000 back, then 50,000 is still in your deal now your returns are based on what's still originally in the deal. So you see how there's this big jump from 10% to 20%. You still have the same cash flows throughout year three, four, and five. The only difference though is the amount of principal that's still within the deal. So if, if investors are asking you this question, oh, well, if the cash flows are still the same, why is that even though you're percentage goes up to, to 20%, uh, they might expect 20,000 in cash flows compared to what's actually happening. So I would say be prepared to answer that question if you are modeling a refinance into that deal, because it does come out, um, come across pretty often if you are modeling for that. Next up, you have your average annualized return. This is just your total returns. That's your including your cash flows and exit profits divided by your total equity invested over the number of years that is throughout the holding period. So for us, uh, as just an example, we usually have a five-year holding period. And just to make numbers simple, again, we just put $10,000 in cash flow throughout years one to five, and then you have a $50,000 uh, profit at the exit. So you're essentially 2Xing your capital. You're, once you're finished with the deal, you would have made an additional 100,000. And so if you plug it into this formula, you would get an average annualized return of 20%. Now the average annualized return, this one, it's it's the one that people can comprehend, uh, I guess, aside from the cash on cash, the easiest, just because they can, they can, comp, they can calculate it by hand. Uh, and also if you're comparing it to just like the other rates of return, this one looks to be the prettiest just because in, in general, these returns are going to be higher. Um, but that's just something, I don't know, just something to take, a, take it into account. 
Let's see. All right. Next up, we have the equity multiple. That's your total cash distributions over the total equity invested. This is a very, very common investment metric that people use just because they're they're able to easily check off the box of, of how much they can expect to receive from this investment. Uh, the only caveat to this one, though, that the equity multiple doesn't take into account is the amount of time that you're actually in the deal. And most often for, for the equity multiple, I mean, for the, for the calls that I've been on, it's, I mean, I don't really have to break it down, but it is always nice to just talk through it in case anybody does have questions about it. The only thing it doesn't account for is the time invested. So you could have the same equity multiple. You can just be in the deal a lot, a lot longer than you would think. So for example, like scenario one, we have a five-year holding period. Uh, again, we'll use the $10,000 cash flows throughout the holding period uh, each year, and that'll get you a 2x multiple. But then you can also have the same 2x equity multiple on a 10-year holding period, and you're in the deal for 10 years. So just an easy way to break down just the differences and what that would look like. But for a majority of the time, if they're already asking about the, the holding period, I mean, you don't necessarily need to break that down anyways. And then now we get to the internal rate of return. It's the discount rate that causes the net present value of all cash flows throughout the investment to become equal to zero. Now, whenever I say this on the on my investment calls, which I never do because it's just really complicated to comprehend, especially if you're just learning about this. And so what's what's a better way to actually articulate this and get somebody to understand what this actually means? It's just the time adjusted return on your money. And it doesn't necessarily mean accounting for inflation. It just takes into account when you invest your capital and when you receive your return and that capital back. And so it's this idea that cash in hand today is worth more than cash in hand tomorrow. And so if you take a look at just these three different scenarios. We have a development deal, a value add syndication where you refi in year two, and then you have an early exit. Now we're investing a hundred thousand in the, uh, in for each of those different scenarios. And then you have actually the same amount of profit that's for, for each of the different scenarios as well. But as you can tell, so here's the same amount of profit same amount of initial investment. But if you look over here on the right, you're going to see that there's a difference in return for each of them. Why is that? Well, for the development deal, there's actually no cash flow throughout the five-year holding period until there's that big profit at the end. And so that'll net you in 15% IRR. Value at syndication, there's that refinance in year two, and that's what's going to boost the IRR there. And then if you have an early exit, that's going to boost your IR because you're getting that capital back and you're getting that return back a lot sooner with the idea that if we give it back to you, there is that opportunity cost to say, hey, you now can reinvest this capital wherever you'd like at a lot sooner time period than having to wait years later. And so uh, just, a, I guess, a, a little bit of a breakdown. But honestly, when it comes to breaking down these types of returns, I've Unless I can do it within, uh, like if you can do it within two sentences, great, but you definitely don't want to go into the rabbit hole. Oh, wait, hold on. Before we get into, in, I mean, you definitely don't want to get to go into that rabbit hole. But uh, before we go into that, though, last one, the preferred return. When we go, when I talk about the preferred return, everyone, I mean, not everyone, but there's a number of people like, oh, what is my guaranteed return? I use this uh this terminology as the closest thing that you can get to a return because it this is where the alignment of interest come in between the general partners and the passive investors meaning that you as the passive investor would need to reach that preferred return before we can participate in cash flows and profits from the property and so it's just saying that you need to hitch that return before we can win so if you win we win investor first returns now, uh, going back to what I was originally saying, when you're talking through all of these different metrics and trying to break it down, it's it's very easy to actually 
dig yourself in a rabbit hole. So like, for example, there's, if you were to just go with the preferred return, there's different categories to that preferred return. There's going to be your cumulative preferred return, non-cumulative preferred return. If there's a GP catch-up uh, for that preferred return. And so if you just summarize it with, if you're on these investment calls, summarize it within one to two sentences, make sure it's really quick, but make sure you stay out of that rabbit hole. So you don't um, have to constantly explain yourself and, and not, and sort of lose that traction of uh, or direction of the conversation. And so with these two, these are actually two articles that we have on hand, ready to go to send out to the to the investors after the call, just so they can follow up and learn a little bit more and, and learn at their own time. Because if you're going to, if let's say you're on this call for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or even 30 minutes, you want to make sure that the best use of time is to just understand them and their goals, not trying to understand and break down why the internal rate of return is calculated like this and going through the, the entire um, theory behind why, why this is the way it is. Uh, so definitely keep it high level. And I actually have Talia that's going to be uh, putting in the two articles that we have. You can also do it in video format as well. If that's a little bit easier, you enjoy making videos uh, and you can have like little effects or animations that actually, um, you know, effects or animations that you can model and use and they can, they can understand it as well. But either article, video, make sure you just have something in hand to pass them so they can just do a further deep dive themselves. Now, some of the frequently asked questions when it comes to returns, there's the frequency of distributions, if they're going to be receiving it on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, or there's no cash flows at all. And then also when that first distribution is going to look like, uh, so, I mean, pretty standard. Uh, the next one is return on capital, return of capital. I, I mean, to be honest, I haven't really seen too many deals that are return of capital, um, but it's always good to just break that down. I mean, especially if they ask. Another common question when it comes to returns is are the distribution's net of fees. And so if you account for, a, honestly, if, if you were to put out your offering memorandum, I mean, just don't include the fees in there. It already is always just, uh, excuse me. The returns that you put in, I mean, you can include the fees, like the acquisition fee, asset management fee, and the disposition fee, but make sure that just the returns that you're seeing are net of fees, just so we can make it an easier conversation. You don't have to do your back. You don't have to um, calculate those calculations backwards just to get what they can expect per year. Then you can, uh, another one, common question is the equity waterfall, just what those equity splits would look like. So, um, you know, if if there's a 7% preferred return, what happens after you reach that 7% pre preferred return? It's going to be a 70-30 split. Are there, is it going to be an 80-20 split? Are there performance hurdles where it goes to a different split? Uh, just make sure you know what those answers to those questions are. Where you are in the capital stack is also a frequently asked question. So behind debt, is there MES debt? Is there a preferred equity tier? Are they common equity and I mean, this is essentially asked just because investors just want to know where they are and how much risk they're taking onto the deal. And then this one, this one has been coming up a little bit more. Uh, and in that, I mean, that's just because interest rates are pretty high. And so I know that the break-even occupancy and what those returns would look like at that break-even occupancy has been a question that's been asked. Uh, but more importantly, too, is at what rate is that break-even occupancy calculated at? Um, and let's say it is 100% occupied and at this type of interest rates, what can they expect? And is the cash flow still, I mean, is the property still cash flowing? So here's an example of what we use for our deals. And, and this is typically, typically on pages, what, 13 or 14 or 9 and 10 of our offering memorandum. And so you can see the capital stack on here on the left side. Then you have our class A and class B partnership structures here on the bottom left. And then here is where you can dive into just the what they can expect in terms of cash flows uh, throughout the holding period. And then once you go through the cash flows, definitely have a sensitivity analysis modeling um, your, the exit strategy, just so they can get an idea of um, 
if the market goes well, if the market is not doing well, and that's where you um, you can model your 50 basis point cap rate expansion or compression just to give them an idea of what those returns would look like. And then something that we do on top of this as well is we, as you can look here, we go through the uh, the blended option. I mean, we talk about the blended option, but then we provide a, a, a blended Excel calculator here so they can view their potential returns. Um, but very often it's, I mean, even just based on calls, unless they're just doing quick, quick math using the, the equity multiple, they just want to see how, especially if they're new, they just want to see what different investments, um, what different investments will yield, especially if you have like this bonus structure. I'm like pointing over here, like I <laughs> think you can see my finger, this bonus structure over here. Um, they want to just like see what that could yield and potentially, um, and it'll help them just gain a better understanding of um, what they can expect throughout the deal. And so here's actually what one of our investment calculators look like. Um, you can toggle your class A investment amount, toggle your class B investment amount, uh, and it's just a summary of what you can expect in cash flows that the holding period. Um, and then here's your uh, the the total return if you were to let's say you know, put all in class A, all in class B, or have a nice little blend of of the two. And so the gives some the the investor just a resource that they can actually just use and comprehend. We got a question here. The presentation is going to be sent out in an email. So I'll make sure to send it over to our team. They can put the presentation in the email along with a webinar replay. Because I know we are going through this pretty quick. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate the question. There you go. So yeah, this is this is essentially just what the investment calculator would look like at least this is what we do at passiveinvesting.com. Um, and I feel like this is just a pretty comprehensive guide to just letting the investors understand what they can expect throughout the holding period. And that is that. I know we went through that pretty quick, but let's just go right into questions that y'all might have. Let me stop sharing my screen. What's the benefit to the investor investing in class B or were class A? Do they have an option to select one over the other? Yes. So they do have the option to select one over the other. And to be quite honest, so this deal was when interest rates were a lot lower and we had a lot more cash flows to distribute. And so class A is our preferred shares. And so that is your you it's priority priority investor returns, priority cash flows. Of The only thing, though, is that you don't get to participate in the profits uh, from when we exit. So there's no upside, but you, uh, you are higher up on the capital sec. Yeah, so I can put here, I'll put my information here. Let me put my information there, and then we can have a follow-up conversation. Oh, you just, I just put my name. I was trying to shift <laughs> enter. Uh, here's my number. And then my email. And then we can chat. Whether it's going to be about our deals or even if you have any questions about what you're, how you're trying to educate your investors on the returns, be happy to help out and assist. For class A, the chart showed 145,000 return when the total profit was. Let's see. Let me go back to the presentation. Let's see what you're talking about. Oh, you're talking about right here? Yeah, the total return is 45%. Right here. Let's see. No, that should be... Yeah, this one is a little, uh, I don't know why this is saying actually 145%. This shouldn't, this shouldn't have been <laughs> good. This, this part is incorrect. I mean, it should just implement, implement the, the subtotal. It shouldn't actually show the percentage. Great catch though. Great catch, Curtis. 
Oh yeah, Q&A is right here. Generally, what sort of return percentage are you offering today? That'll depend. Thanks for the question, Rob. That'll depend on the asset class. So well, to be quite honest, just here at passiveinvesting.com, we haven't done a um, we haven't done a multifamily deal in nine to ten months. And it's it just because I mean the margins on these deals are pretty difficult and it just hasn't been able to meet our criteria and cash flows are a lot lower as well. So I would say multifamily, you're probably anticipating anywhere between four to high six percent cash on cash return. And then I mean, maybe IRR, you're looking anywhere between 10 to 15% IRR. Uh, so the yield is definitely a lot lower, especially in this interest rate environment. I, I, and I would say it's similar to, to storage, um, unless there's going to be a big value add component to it. And then for car, well, I mean, car washes is, is, is a little bit different. Uh, and so the car washes, you're looking anywhere between a 7 to 10%. Uh, cash on cash throughout the holding period. But that's a, like a completely different business plan um, just because revenues are calculated differently or are, are done differently. The, the bit uh, capitalizing on operational efficiencies are, are way different than multifamily. Um, so it depends on the asset class, cash on cash, probably four to high sixes uh, and then 10 to 15% IRR on the back end. How best to explain the hurdle where above a certain return, the split becomes more favorable of for the GP without seeming greedy? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the honest, so so honestly, I don't. There, there's not really a good. There, there's, it's not the same that there's a. No matter how you, it, it matters more about how you frame the how the the uh the split is presented versus um versus i guess like a a very routine way of pre presenting it so it it matters more on the presentation of how you explain it uh not just like what's within the wording because we actually have gotten this where we were at an investor dinner and this investor was just like why why are the why is the operation team so greedy, right? If you if you answer that and trying to explain we, why we aren't greedy, then you're now you you've lost your frame. Now you're just trying to defend yourself, and you sort of lose this um, authority frame. And so, whenever that comes, we just say this: this is this is our fees. Like this is this is for the amount of work that we do. This is for this is for the putting the deal together. This is this is just what we offer, um, and so it's. I mean, the um, yeah. I mean, there's not really like a a great way other than saying like this is this is it. There's 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 nothing more to it. Um, yeah, definitely definitely don't backtrack on it. If and if you believe it, then just believe it within cadence. Uh, I mean, with a with a strong cadence, and and that's it. Um, don't backtrack and try and explain. So, oh, you know, well, I mean, you guys get to do the, I'm just totally moving around in this conversation because my mind's going a lot of different ways. Cause there's another, there was a, another conversation that came up where let's say like is a 60, 40. There, so for our car wash deals, for example, there's two performance hurdles. There's a 60, 40 split up until a 20% IRR, then a 40-60 split up until a 30% IRR, and then anywhere after a 30% IRR, the split is 10% LP, 90% GP. Now, if you, we've had people say, wow, 10% LP, 90% GP, the GP is really getting a lot of the returns, but that's only if you reach a 30% IRR. And if you want to compare our 30% IRR to any other deal that's out there, we think a 30% IRR is a great deal. And if you think it's too greedy, then that's, that's it. I don't think this deal is going to be aligning with you. And so just talk more about the frame instead of just trying to explain the greediness, even though I don't, I don't think you are being greedy if you're putting in all the work. So it's, it's a, it's a partnership when it comes to talking with your investors. Long-winded answer, Dave, but hopefully I answered that. Oh, thanks, Lynn. Appreciate that. 